All right, let's go ahead and get started. Our clocks are gone, so uh, <laughs> that'll make things a lot easier <laughs> instead of watching that all night. All right, so uh, welcome, welcome. Um, we are getting started a little late. The city Council has been going actually since 5.30 in executive session. Actually, five. they've been going since 5.30. I showed up at 5.35-ish. So, But anyway, so we have been going. So uh, sorry that we're uh, making y'all wait. We have been working, believe it or not. So uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, roll call. Mayor Bagley. Here. Council Members Christensen. Here. Hidalgo Firing. Here. Martin. Here. Peck. Rodriguez, Here. Waters, Here. you have a quorum. Let's say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I find it amazing that we can chant airball like, like at the same time, no problem, but the pledge sometimes we're all. Out of sync. But anyway, let's go ahead and chair reminder of the public. Anyone wishing to add their name? If you want to speak at public invited to be heard, youth council, you're going to rock it tonight, it looks like. So, uh, but if you want to speak, um, you need to get your name on the list before it starts. And uh, if uh, you don't get on the list, we'll just go ahead and put you at the back of the meeting or at the end of the meeting. You'll still get a chance. Everyone will get three minutes. At the end of three minutes, I'll have to cut you off. So let's go ahead and move on to approval of minutes. So I have a motion to approve the minutes of January 14th, 2020. And it looks like we might have an issue with the agenda. With the minutes? Oh, so yeah, the minutes. It's, it's a correction to page 10, just capturing the public, the results of the public vote. Uh, did I not read it out? You read it out, yeah. The, in the minutes that were in the packet, it did not have those two lines that showed, that oh. highlighted, that show how... Council voted on those appointments. Well, thank you very much, whoever caught that. Do we have a motion to uh, approve the minutes um, with the, uh, adding the exception of Council Members Christensen, Hidalgo Faring, Martin Peck, Rodriguez, and Waters voting for Alice Davis, and Mayor Bagley voting for Matthew Spencer? <laughs> as corrected? All right, we have a motion to uh, approve the minutes as modified. It's been moved by Council Member Hidalgo Faring, it's been seconded by Council Member Martin. Let us vote. Uh, okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you, thank you. All right, let's move on to agenda revisions and submissions of documents. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Actually, I just got an announcement that I would like to make rather than uh, have any additions to the agenda. I was just told that um, at the RTD meeting, they selected the uh, interim director, and he's going to be Paul Ballard as RTD's uh, new GM and CEO. So that was just recently, a couple of hours ago, they did that. Well, we, we wish Mr. Ballard luck and success, and may he give us everything we want. All right, let's go ahead. Uh, City Manager, do you have a report? Mayor, I do have a quick report. Um, okay. As we're um, continuing to get ready for the census, we're going to be giving you some updates, and we have a quick 30-second video. Cool. We had been together for 25 years. We had so many more things that we wanted to do in life. A young son that we wanted to do them with. That's awesome. That, uh, my attention is grabbed. Let us continue. Right. You know what? We will show you that. We will show you the uh, census video at the next meeting. Okay. All right, great. Well, good job on that manager's yep. report. Nice and short. All right, next, special reports and presentations. Uh, a proclamation designating January 2020 as National Radon Action Month in Longmont, Colorado. Is that the video we will be watching? I'm thinking so. Okay. Uh, yes, that is the video you will great. be watching. Let, me, let so. me go ahead and read this. Yes. Make this proclamation official, then you can say your words. We'll watch the video. We'll take a picture. Okay. That okay? Thank you. All right. This is a proclamation designated in January 2020 as National Radon Action Month in Longmont, Colorado. Whereas radon is an invisible, odorless, radioactive gas that threatens the health of our citizens and their families. And whereas radon is a leading environmental cause of cancer mortality in the U.S. and the eighth leading cause of cancer mortality overall. 
And whereas the Colorado Rocky Mountain region has been ranked Zone 1, an area with the highest radon potential possible by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and whereas Colorado residential radon data has shown 50% of Colorado homes tested as being at or above the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency radon action level of 4.0, Pico Curies per liter of air, and Richard Jude right now, probably if he's watching this, I don't know, is that Pico Curies? Did I? Yes. Okay. Whew. All right. Whereas Colorado residential radon data, data has shown 50% of Colorado, oops, sorry, I just read that. Whereas any home in Longmont, Colorado may have elevated levels of radon, even if homes in the same neighborhood do not. And whereas supporting, re supporting recommended radon practices and policies to reduce radon exposure is important to protect our community's health and welfare. And whereas Boulder County Public Health, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the American Lung Association are supporting efforts to encourage Americans to test their homes for radon, have elevated levels of radon reduced, and have new homes built with radon-resistant features. Now, therefore, I, Brian J. Bagley, Mayor, by virtue of the authority vested in me and the City Council of the City of Longmont, do hereby proclaim January 1st through 31st, 2020, is National Radon Action Month in Longmont. Encourage all residents to complete a simple and inexpensive test for radon and to mitigate radon if found. Sign the mayor. So thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. Uh, please say what you're going to say, but also if you could please help us understand as residents where to complete a simple and inexpensive test, that'd be great. Yes. Uh I'll introduce myself. I'm Susan Martino. I'm an environmental health specialist with Boulder County Public Health. And people can purchase an inexpensive test kit from the CSU Extension Office that's located at the fairgrounds. And they sell them at cost for $15. And that includes the test kit, the analysis by the laboratory, and the postage. So um, it's, it's a very simple process to do, and anyone can do it themselves. And so in honor of National Radon Action Month, I'm going to play a very quick informational video on radon. We had been together for 25 years. We had so many more things that we wanted to do in life. A young son that we wanted to do them with. Colorado happens to be one of the worst states in the nation for radon levels. My exposure for the 10 years that I worked in a home office, that's what resulted in my cancer. Radon is an odorless, naturally occurring gas. It's a derivative of uranium which occurs in the crust of the earth. It's in our ground and it seeps up. Just by breathing radon at the average house in Colorado, you are getting radiation damage equivalent to 200 chest x-rays a year. The EPA estimates that in homes there will be about 22,000 lung cancer deaths a year caused by radon. The more you breathe radon, or the higher the radon value, the more chance you have of one of those DNA being hit and the cell mutated. It is the leading cause of lung cancer, aside from smoking. The thing with lung cancer is you don't feel anything until you're into maybe stage three or stage four. Wheezing, shortness of breath, there are many, many things that can cause those kinds of symptoms and um, so people don't necessarily go to the doctor. There are other states where there's legislation that radon um, has to be measured in any new home built or in a home that changes hands. Um, he was only 58 years old when he passed away, and we had a 13-year-old son. I'm hoping that we will progress in our legislation to make it a requirement, especially for new builds and in real estate transactions, that it is a requirement to test for radon. How often do you? How often is it suggested that homes be tested for radon? Um, usually, if someone's tested and it's less than four picocuries, uh, we recommend that they test every five years. And what if it's nothing? 
If it's nothing, that's fine, but you should still test because different conditions can cause radon to increase. Okay, just curious. All and right. if, if you have a radon system, it should be checked every two years. Okay. Would you like to make a statement? Or was the video your statement? Well, the video was my statement, but I also want to say thank you very much for supporting us and every year issuing the proclamation in support of National Radon Action Month. Uh, Boulder County Public Health appreciates it very much as we try to get people to uh, learn more about radon and take care of their health. Do we have any currently, do we have an ordinance or any type of legislation here locally that would require radon to be tested for upon the exchange or building of a new home? No, we don't. There is nothing in Colorado that says that you have to test or you have to mitigate. Now, it's good in the city of Longmont that they do have building code that says all new single family homes have to be built radon resistant. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are pushing be because of health equity that all new multifamily homes also be built radon resistant which would entail amending the code that you now have. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Christensen? Thank you for drawing this to our attention. Um, it is really important. Uh, however, as I said last year, um, most of us can test for this and it's fairly inexpensive, mm -hmm. but mitigating it costs um, approximately a couple thousand dollars per household. and. On the website, um, there, there are plenty of people who will test for it. There are very few people that will actually do the mitigation. So it would be very helpful to put, a sor put sources of actual people who actually do the mitigation. If you go to their websites, they only test for it. Well, we actually do have a, a link on the Boulder County website to okay. both mitigators and testers. Okay. And I would like to say the State Health Department has a low income radon mitigation program. Oh. Okay. And if you qualify for the program, they can install a radon system. They will have their own mitigators ah. install a radon mitigation system in the home of people who qualify. Oh, that's very helpful, thank you. And it, it might be very good for us to examine the possibility of uh, having um, a regulation in this city that requires any real estate transaction to uh, disclose whether there is radon. Mm -hmm. And they do have that in Fort Collins, and they also in Fort Collins require multifamily homes be built radon resistant. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. We hear about Fort Collins a lot. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Let's go ahead and Thank make a picture you. if you don't mind. I would love to. All right, let's go ahead and there's another thing you're supposed to do. Ah, the quarterly updated activities, the Longmont Economic Development Partnership is just, oh, there you are. I was like, where'd Jessica go? You're hard to miss. Right you're hard to miss right now. When do you do? Next month? Early March. All right, well, you can go ahead and have a seat and use, there you go. Mayor Bagley and Council. Am I, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm Jessica Erickson, President and CEO of Longmont Economic Development Partnership, here to present my quarterly report 
of activities of the partnership. And really what we're going to be looking at this evening as much as possible is overall 2019 results. Um, we would typically present these in early February, so we're still um, kind of gathering data um, as it trickles in throughout the month, which is the reason you also have in front of you, I believe now version three of our metrics report, and there may be some minor changes um, to that between now and when we actually publish our full annual report in February, which we will of course share with you um, when it's ready. I do want to remind you that this report is based on um, our 2019 contract, um, which was structured around our four core service areas of um, the overall advanced Longmont economic development strategy, as well as primary industry, local business, and startup community development. Um, this is different from what has now been approved, the 2020 contract, which is structured around what we'll talk about momentarily, the um, now focus areas of the Advanced Longmont 2.0 strategy. Speaking of the Advanced Longmont 2.0 strategy, our primary goal within our 2019 contract with the city relative to the strategic plan was a complete overhaul and update of that strategic plan that was originally adopted in 2013 and began implementation in 2014. And so just a reminder that the Advanced Longmont 2.0 strategy is structured under a collective impact framework and that's intended to bring the entire community together in a structured way to achieve social and economic change, our economic development goals as a community. The process that we undertook to, um, to do the update and to uh, develop the Advanced Longmont 2.0 strategy was what we call analyzing the landscape, which was the overall market assessment of conditions in Longmont as they exist today, especially in comparison to as they existed when the original Advanced Longmont strategy was adopted just about five years prior. Um, initiate dialogue, which were, were the conversations that we had not only with our partners, but members of the community in developing the strategy, creating the common agenda that we'll talk about um, in a moment, and then where we're at today, which is implementation and learning from um, both our wins and um, challenges that we face as we implement the strategy. I did want to remind you too that one of the things that we did differently with Advanced Longmont 2.0 than with the, with the original Advanced Longmont strategy is rather than just looking at our economy and economic conditions here in Longmont from the kind of standard economic development lens of growth, which is what most people think of when they think of economic development, we also took a look at how that growth um, had spread itself across our entire community from the perspective of both prosperity and inclusion. Ultimately, Advanced Longmont 2.0 gives us a couple things. It gives us an update of our targeted industry clusters. These are industry clusters that we focus our resources on in terms of attraction and expansion because these clusters have um, high concentrations already within the city of Longmont as well as the high highest potential for growth in coming years um, based on the data assessment that we did. And so our new targeted industry clusters are smart manufacturing, business catalysts, which are uh, B2B service provider type businesses, um, food and beverage, and knowledge creation and deployment, which is really research and development as an industry. And then, most importantly, Advanced Longmont 2.0 gives us our common agenda, um, which is focused on um, the areas of talent, um, developing a pipeline, as well as attracting new talent to our community, place, um, creating a place in Longmont that's appealing not only for um, new needed talent to relocate here, but also for um, business investment and growth. Industry is really our focus on growing the targeted industries I mentioned before. Connectivity is the important work of um, uh, transportation connectivity, locally, regionally, and nationally for our community. And then impact is really the overall strategy um, and includes things like policy and bringing together um, leadership around the rest of the focus areas. We have, um, specific to the fourth quarter, we have convened working groups around all of these focus areas. And so our collective impact structure is really that what um, was our existing advanced Longmont Partners Group now becomes the steering committee for all of the work that's being done. Longmont Economic Development uh, Partnership, the backbone organization, and then our working groups as well as our total community networks um, being really where the work is getting done to implement this strategy. Again, the working groups have been formed and have been meeting on a monthly basis and have completed or are close to completing um, 
uh, action plans for 2020, so action plans of all the work that they intend to accomplish um, through 2020, and in some cases beyond. Anyone who is interested in reading the full strategy, as well as following the progress of those action plans, we do have a website that includes a data dashboard and all of the action plans and progress reports, um, and that is advance.longmont.org. You can also get to it from our website, which is just longmont.org. Okay, so the next area of focus for us in 2019 was primary industry development. We had a stated target in the contract to attract, relocate, or expand 10 primary industry businesses that would create 500 new well-paying jobs and invest 50 million in new capital investment. The, number that, the numbers that appear in our metrics report, and I'll explain a little bit because they are a lot higher than what we were projecting of 74 businesses, 1,135 new jobs, and nearly $130 million in capital investment as a result of the work of Longmont EDP in 2019. This does include businesses that expanded through use of our Enterprise Zone program. So if we take those out and look at just prospect activity or what we traditionally consider economic development, um, those results would have been um, 14 businesses, 990 jobs, and $100 million in capital investment. So still well exceeding um, our target. And we'll be looking at how we separate those out. Um, I realized as I was putting this together, it might be a little bit misleading when we're um, combining both. We, of course, annually work to retain 100% of our primary employers and jobs. 100% um, is not possible because there are market forces well beyond our control that are impacting whether companies stay open and stay located here in Longmont. But, of course, our goal is always to keep all of the companies and the jobs here within our primary industry base and so our results, um, and these are estimates based on primary data collected by our organization through a year-end survey of our primary industry businesses, that at the end of or at the start of 2019, there were 236 primary industry businesses, and that should say at the end of 2019, 2019 not 18, there were 240 businesses. The movement within um, that year were that we retained 221 existing primary industry businesses industry businesses, or 93.6% of what we started with, 15 businesses closed or moved out of Longmont, and 19 were new or added to Longmont. They did, weren't located in Longmont prior to the start of 19. And then when we look at it from the perspective of jobs, we started the year with 11,130 primary jobs and ended the year with 11,191. Again, the movement throughout the year within um, those primary industry jobs was that we retained 10,685, or 96% of all those that we started the year with, um, experienced a loss of 433, an addition of 506, so net increase of 73 jobs, um, just under 0.7%, which is aligned with overall job growth within the community. Um, relative to local business development, so our local businesses are those businesses that are serving um, the local area, so most of their business is coming from residents and other businesses within the community. Our goal there was to attract, relocate, or expand 10 local businesses that would create 50 new jobs and invest $5 million in new capital investment. Um, you'll note that we did fall short of achieving that goal with six businesses um, creating 15 new jobs and just over 300000 in investment. Um, this is primarily a timing issue. We do have a strong pipeline of local businesses, um, including a number of those which we are working with um, the DDA, um, with retail conversion grants, mm. as well as a couple that we're working um, with the city, larger local businesses that we're working with the city on that have the potential, would have had the potential to get us there had they completed their project or announced their project before the end of 2019. So activity there is still strong, though we didn't meet our target um, specifically for 2019. Um, relative to startup community development, again, our, our target was to support the launch of 10 new ventures that would create 20 new jobs. Um, we almost got there with the creation or the launch of seven new ventures through um, work with Longmont Economic Development Partnership and 17 new jobs. We have since then spun out our Innovate Longmont program 
um, so that it is its own um, 501c3 organization um, with its own executive director, its own um, goals, uh, funded by Longmont EDP currently, but with a long-term goal to be a self-funded, self-sustaining accelerator organization for the community. They are already in 2020 working with seven um, startup businesses as part of that program with a goal again this year to, um, uh, to have at least 10 new businesses participate and in and launch out of um, that accelerator program. And so when we look at overall um, job growth, year over year job growth, 2018 to 2019, 401 net new jobs added. This is across all industries um, and across primary, local, and startup, uh, which is 0.7% overall job growth, leaving us with a total of 56,134 uh, total jobs in the Longmont area as of the end of 2019. When we look at that longer term from a five-year job growth perspective, um, nearly 4,000 net new jobs added over the last five years, uh, equating to 7.5% job growth, um, just over the national average of 7.3% overall job growth. And then when we narrow that down to our targeted industries, again, these are industries where we expect to see higher job growth. That's why we focus our resources on um, working to attract and expand these industries in particular. Um, we see a positive, significantly positive job growth um, across all four of those targeted industries um, with a total of 2.1% job growth um, compared to 0.7% overall job growth um, when we look at all jobs in the community. And with that, I will answer any questions. Just the thing that comes to mind, nobody's in the queue right now, but I think it's kind of cool to see food and beverage down compared to the others. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean that, that's usually the heavy hitter, and you're like, eh. It but is. it's good to see that, that the other three are, are more promising. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Backley. Uh, thank you for this report, Jessica. But um, we have had several businesses close in the past, it seems like two weeks or three mm -hmm. weeks. Do you have, is there a common thread that is running through as to why they are closing in Longmont? Um, it, it would depend on, I, mean, I know there are, have been a number of restaurants that have announced closures and those have ranged anywhere from um, personal reasons, illness of the ownership to, um, to down business. So there are a variety of different reasons. Um, there's not a trend that we okay. can point to that says this is happening and is causing those types of businesses to close down in our community. I can tell you from a restaurant perspective, we are probably as a community, based on what's happened over the course of the last few years, over-restauranted, if I might <laughs> coin a term, um, and potentially over-retailed as well in some cases. And so we'll watch that closely, but I think that's um, both uh, individual business issues as well as market forces that there wouldn't be anything that a city government or an economic development organization could really do anything about. Um, there's the unique, very unique um, situation I've been reading about in detail with Lucky's. Yes. Um, they just, I mean, simply over leveraged um, if you understand the financials of that. they, I mean, they were um, acquired by, or not acquired, but invested heavily by Kroger and ultimately ended up owing Kroger over $300 million um, with $15 million in the bank. So um, mm. whatever you want to <laughs> take from that. And so that, again, is not an indicator of anything that's happening in the economy or in the community. Um, we do have our economic summit coming up at the end of February we'll, where we'll have a regional economic forecast. But all of the forecasts that I've seen from Wobekind and others um, suggest a slower 2020, but still a strong 2020 in particular for the Boulder County and Northern Colorado regions. Okay, and I assume that if you did see a trend that was happening, you, you would, would let be the us first know. to know. Yes, Thank absolutely. You very much. Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. <clears throat> Jessica, I think the first, my first meeting as a council member several years ago, you were on the agenda doing a quarterly report. Will you, do you remember that? I absolutely yeah, remember I that. Uh, is it me? <laughs> is it just me? Or um, uh, have you come that far with, it may be just that I'm looking at it differently. But the data, um, there's, there, is, there is serious meaning mm -hmm. in the data that you shared tonight. And I just, you, you shared a lot of information. I might remember my observation was mm -hmm. it was a sea of information, but not necessarily a whole lot of meaning, at least for me in those Absolutely. moments. Mm -hmm. 
but this is, it's, it seems to me, this is a quarterly report where you've knocked a bunch out of uh, home runs here. I mean, uh, you set a, a stretch goal of 100%, which is simply unattainable, and, um, and hit a 94% success rate, which I think anybody's book would be an A, right? Mm -hmm. um, so is it just the, 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 the sophistication of the data, where you come, Longmont Strategy 2.0? What, what's different than what I saw a couple years ago from your perspective? I think it's a combination. So a couple of years ago, we were just a couple of years into the original advanced Longmont strategy. Um, also, when I I started with Longmont Economic Development Partnership in, in 2015 with an organization that was kind of a shell. It had been without an executive director for almost two years, um, and then a variety of other challenges, um, uh, fiscally and otherwise, that it was facing. Um, so we were probably just coming out of rebuilding at that time. And um, since then, we've been able to focus on evolving, growing um, as an organization from the talent that we've added to our team, um, from the significant uh, improvement and increase in private sector investment in our organization has allowed us to invest significantly more in a variety of data sources to give us the opportunity to be more accurate um, and have a better understanding of um, where our resources are needed and where our time is best spent um, to just with Advanced Longmont 2.0 over the last you're engaging more people in the work of, of economic development. So it's just a variety of things that have happened over the course of the last couple of years, not the least of which is a council that is fully engaged. So I will say I appreciate that, but a council that's fully engaged, city staff leadership that's fully engaged and participating in the work that, that we're doing. Well, I want to say thanks and good on you. I, uh, you've done a great job. You also know how to identify talent. You've surrounded yourself with a great team. Yeah, so absolutely. It's, fun, been, it's been fun to see the development. Thank you. Us. Great talent in Morgan. Yes. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Morgan's awesome. Yes, we just lock them in a basement. <laughs> yes, so. yes, yes. All right. Uh, uh, Councilmember Christensen. Hi. Um, I do think that you probably analyzed it right that we are losing a lot of restaurants. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of the um, companies that we're losing that are not. Uh, Food related, but that's because I, I'm just not that aware. I eat more than I <laughs> sure. do anything else. Um, however, I I am concerned that part of this it seems to me has to do with the rising commercial rents, mm -hmm. and also with the dropping discretionary income. And I I think we really need to think about what we can do, or consider how much of a problem this is with both of those things. Or Longmont, and uh, think about that in terms of our concept of building mixed-use neighborhoods and walkable neighborhoods. If there's nothing to walk to, and uh, we're not uh, able to have mixed-use developments because there isn't enough uh, retail or office space needed, so I do think we need to be having discussions about that in the future. Thanks. I appreciate that comment. That's a part of why we took the approach with Advanced Longmont 2.0 of looking not just at growth, which is the standard historic measure of economic development, but also looking at prosperity and inclusion. Um, I will say that, um, and I'll go back and check this, but I don't believe the data shows that overall as a city um, we're seeing uh, lower discretionary income. There are certainly subsets of um, our community of our population that are experiencing that lower, but overall as a community, the data wouldn't suggest that we're experiencing general um, lessening of discretionary income or lowering of wages or um, median household incomes um, over in recent years. I will double check that because I don't have the data in front of me. Um, if that proves to be different than what I'm saying, I will let you know. But my recollection of the data is that overall, again, also why we look at prosperity and inclusion is because we want to think about more than just the overall and think about every citizen in the community and how they're experiencing um, the growth that we're experiencing overall. Well, on behalf of council, thank you very much. Thank you. You're approaching month nine, you're going strong, <laughs> and it's just... <laughs> yeah, you won't see me up here again for a little while. Yeah, you're a superwoman. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, let's move on to the rest of our agenda. We doing okay? There's no clock. It's currently... 8 o'clock, so we've been going about an hour. Let's push through. First call, public invited to be heard. 
We have some special guests. So let's start with Olga Bermudez. Are we batching it? No, you're, okay. you're doing great. All right. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and City Council members. My name is Olga Bermudez, and I uh, work for the City of Longmont at Children, Youth, and Families. And I'm here tonight uh, because I would like to introduce Longmont Youth Council. They would like to share with you some of the projects that they are working on on this year. Uh, I would like to welcome Longmont Youth Council. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and City Council members. I am Brianna Jimenez, and I am a senior at Twin Peaks Charter Academy. I am president of the Longmont Youth Council. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor Bagley and council members. I'm Ming Liu. Um, uh, I'm a senior at Long Nawat High School, and I'm a vice president of Youth Council. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and council members. I am Olga Rochlinka. I'm a freshman at Nawat High School, and I am the secretary of Youth Council. Uh, good evening, my name is Ishmael Dominguez, and I'm a junior at Niwot High School, and I'm the treasurer for Longmont Youth Council. Good evening, my name is Sammy Linsky. I'm a 10th grader at Silver Creek High School, and I'm the social media director for Youth Council. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sydney Walker. I'm a junior at Silver Creek High School, and I'm a member of the Longmont Youth Council. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and council members. My name is Julia Harper, and I'm a freshman at Niwot High School. Good evening, my name is Emma Milchuk, and I'm a freshman at Silver Creek High School, and I'm also a member of the Youth Council. Good evening, all council members and attendees. Thank can, you you, can you lift that right up and get it right yes. up there? Thank you for inviting us to speak tonight. Over the last few months, we have built our passionate, empowered, and creative group of student leaders to be on Longmont Youth Council. We have brainstormed and chosen issues that we want to spend our year in our efforts working on developing solutions for inside of our community. We are proud to announce our projects for 2020, hunger, voting awareness, sustainability, and mental health and kindness. First, Sammy Lansky will discuss our Halloween for the Hungry project. In Longmont, there is large um, undernourishment and hungry population being beneath, um, hiding beneath the surface. To help address this issue, the Longmont Youth Council did a two-week canned food drive called Halloween for the Hungry. We collected cans from Prospect Neighborhood, local high schools, and the Longmont Public Library. Additionally, this eventually became a collaboration with CSU students who used to live in Longmont that gave us cans. In the end, we collected 253 pounds of non-perishable items that we donated to the local safe shelter, and we actually kept some of the cans at the Children, Youth, and Family Center in Longmont for those who needed it. Um, furthermore, voting rights and legislation are another topic we'd like to focus on this year. Uh, in the project, the focus on pre-registration on um, high schoolers through registration drives, educating them on voting and what the ballot means, uh, and touching the importance of their votes. Uh, um, through working with the League of Women Voters, we were able to use their valuable resources uh, to propel our point further. Uh, we want to empower the youth to not uh, assume that people are going to uh, be representing them. They should uh, uh, represent and speak for themselves. The topic of sustainability is highly important to us. It affects not only the faraway oceans, but us locally as well, with the St. Vrain Valley Basin being clogged by plastic. Each day that we continue to use plastics and release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we are taking a day away from our future. We want to reduce single-use plastics in Longmont and create a, an everyday and more environmentally friendly environment here. This will be a two-year project called STEP, which stands for Save the Earth Project. We want to educate the public, youth, adults, and businesses in order to create a better everyday environment here. Um, we hope to inherit a clean world once we grow older that is not 110 degrees on average. We hope to create solutions through personal community and legislative action. Uh, 
Another project we have chosen to create is a project focusing on youth mental health and positivity. To begin, we will launch a kindness campaign from being more polite to giving compliments to just giving a smile. Small gestures can mean a lot to a person in a dark place. A few ideas we have include promoting Mental Health Month and National Kindness Day. We are also looking into creating stickers with positive quotes. All of that said, the 2020 Logmont Youth Council hopes to make progress to improve our community. We hope to continue to make Logmont a welcoming, eco-friendly, representational, and positive environment. Thank you so much for your time. And just, that's it? All right, we usually don't respond, but anything you guys, so just because you're the youth council, so anything you need from us by way of mayoral proclamation or resolutions on those matters, make sure you talk to us, because we can help. You're there to advise us, so don't forget, we can help. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. All right, cool, good job, guys. All right, you guys can clap, that's all right. We allow clapping for kids. All right, uh, Cody LeBlanc. Good evening. Um, my name is Cody LeBlanc, and I'm the area representative for Congressman Ken Buck for Weld, Adams, Arapahoe, and Boulder counties. Um, so I just wanted to drop by and do a quick congressional update. Um, but before I get started, I also wanted to tell you that I also run the App Challenge, which is a high school program our office runs. And this year, our winning team is actually from Longmont, so I just wanted to let you know. Um, Sinjin Green and Colin Zell submitted an app called Flyer, which allowed uh, high school students to search for jobs that are pertinent to their grade level and their skill set. Um, so that's something that we're very excited. They're from Silver Creek High School. So um, congratulations to them. OK. Sorry, our printer was acting up, so I didn't get a chance to actually print my um, update today. So as you may know, Congressman Buck has been assigned to the House Judiciary Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, those two committees keep him very busy, as we've all seen the past few months with all of the impeachment hearings and everything else going on. Um, so I'll go ahead and first talk about uh, Congressman Buck supporting the full protection of American citizens. Um, as such, he voted against HCR 83, a concurrent resolution that would terminate the, U the use of U.S. armed forces engaging in hostilities in or against Iran. Following the passage in the House, Congressman Buck issued the following statement. I voted against the Democrats' show vote on a war powers concurrent resolution. The resolution manipulates the original intent of the resolution while putting the American lives in jeopardy. As a founding member of the War Powers Caucus, I wholeheartedly believe our con Constitution establishes a separation of powers for a reason, and that includes the authorization for declaring war. President Trump took defensive measures to protect American men and women with the takedown of Soleimani. If the president intends, intends to maintain a long-term aggressive posture towards Iran, he needs to Moved it too quickly. Um, maintain a long-term aggressive posture towards Iran. He needs to come to Congress for authorization. Tensions in Iran are de-escalating, but we need to continue to apply economic pressure, and the president still needs the option to take necessary action if Iran retaliates again. In December, Congressman Buck voted in support of the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement, the USMCA, a mutually beneficial trade deal that will grow our economy and ensure American workers and the businesses are not being left behind. Following passage in the House, Congressman Buck issued the following statement, the USMCA is crucial for the future of American prosperity, as well as our farmers, manufacturers, innovators, and those who continue to stimulate future economic growth. After months of delay, I'm glad to see it pass the House and hope my Senate colleagues act quickly. Congressman Buck voted against House Resolution 755, House Democrats Articles of Impeachment against Donald J. Trump, President of the United States. Congressman Buck spoke on the House floor during the debate of the Articles of Impeachment, stating, Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today, Democrats lower the bar for impeachment. I'm going to have to cut you off only because we nope, give everybody three good. minutes. That's but perfect. Please, but let the congressman know that if he wants to, if he wants to come and spend time with us, he's, he's more than welcome. Well, okay? we appreciate that. If there's ever anything, feel free to reach out to our office. I'll leave cards uh, with Don. Thanks, Mr. LeBlanc. We appreciate Thank you. that. All right, Margaret Halsey.
Good evening. I am here to speak against. Oh, oh sorry. Thank you. Good evening. I'm here to speak against the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board Funding Recommendation 3, the Longmont fam Family Apartments. To prevent confusion, I want you to know that this proposed development has also been called 15th and Ash, 15th and Alta, 833 15th Street, and on a petition presented to City Council on August 27th, 2019, I described it by partial number and address 0, 15th Avenue. This is the top of the petition where I put a picture so everyone would know when they signed. The petition was signed by more than 80 neighbors and it asked that the property be changed from mixed neighborhood to single family zoning because the density of the project proposed by Prospect is not right for the neighborhood and we were hoping to reduce the number of units. I made a map, it's too small, but it shows current and proposed development. Current, the yellow highlights affordable housing and multi-unit housing that already exist, like mobile homes, apartments, and townhomes. It's a nice mix between the not colored part, which is all single family. The aqua shows proposed development. Terry Street townhomes, oh, I, okay, never mind. It's to the east of the prospect proposal is for 15 townhomes. Cinnamon Park senior housing will add 25 units, but the Longmont family apartments will be 88 units. This is too dense for a neighborhood where there are few shops, no bike paths, no parks, no community gathering centers. The nearest hospital is reducing services and urgent care has moved to Main Street, North Main. The development will burden our neighborhood with additional traffic and population and add nothing. In summary, whoops, okay. I, I also have a few pictures showing how this doesn't fit. Here we're looking east on 15th toward the development from the corner of Bross. That's the south side of the street. Here's the north side of 15th. Here are the houses on the west side of 15th and Ash. And here are the houses on the east side of 15th and Ash. All right, I'm gonna have to cut you off, Ms. Halsey, okay. but thank you very much for bringing thank this you. to our attention. Mr. Strider Benston. Ah, uh, yes. Kangaroos have bellies and cows have witnesses and cows have evidence. Um, yeah. um, thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate and thank you, Margaret. I, my neighborhood will be destroyed if they build that street and that many houses also. Um, I... Um, this is great seeing the Youth Council here tonight. I have always believed in democracy. I've been active uh, since joining the Civil Rights Movement 56 years ago. But when I was a kid, I believed in it, but I had no idea what it was. We never had a city council meeting that let people come and speak, or I never knew of it. I never heard of it my whole time in school or anything. So that's really terrific. And two days ago, we had a, a Senate forum uh, filled the uh, uh, auditorium, I mean, the uh, museum and the overflow room, about 700 seats, and nine candidates spoke. It was really, really well done. Um, what we have right now, um, as Greta Turnberger uh, 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 told us last week, 
the earth is on fire. And right now, the number one arsonist in the world is on trial in the United States Senate, um, which used to be considered the greatest deliberative body in the world. But they're sitting there uh, trying to figure out how to make certain that there are no witnesses and no evidence presented um, for the person on trial who's the arsonist of democracy, the arsonist of decency, the arsonist of truth, the arsonist of justice. And they say the greatest deliberative body in the world um, until the Grim Reaper took over, uh, McConnell, and there used to be real debates and real legislation in the United States Senate, but it's hard to remember there were any since Mr. Smith went to Washington. Thank you. You've seen the movie, I'm sure. All right. Um, that concludes uh, first call and uh, first call public invited to be heard. Um, should we go ahead and take a short break? You guys doing okay? All right, let's go ahead and take a five minute break if that's okay. All right.
All right, let's go ahead and get going again. Could we please have our esteemed city clerk? We will give her back her chair. And could you please read off our consent agenda so we can introduce and read these by title on the first reading. Mayor, item 8A is ordinance 2020-08, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to execute a lease extension of real property known as 1140 Boston Avenue to Longmont Wind Air Company, public hearing and second reading scheduled for February 11th, 2020. 8B is resolution 2011, a resolution of the Longmont City Council conditionally approving the sale or donation of property for the development of 2000 Sunset Way, Lot 2, as an affordable housing development. 8C is resolution 2020-12, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving a voluntary alternative agreement for the Sugar Mill Paired Homes development as satisfaction of the city's inclusionary housing requirements. 8D is review and approve the city of Longmont's private activity bond allocation procedures and guidelines. 8E is approve Longmont Youth Council appointments. And 8F is designate the bulletin boards outside the council chambers and the west entrance of the Civic Center as the official city council agenda posting locations for 2020. Dr. Waters. I'd like to pull um, agenda item 8C from the consent agenda. Okay, Councilmember Christensen. Um, I'd like to pull in addition to C, A, and B. All right, Councilmember Peck. All right, they're pulled. All right, do I have a motion? I move that we pass the consent agenda, less A, B, and C. Second. All right, it's been moved by myself, but it was second by Councilmember Martin, it appears. So let's go ahead and vote. Councilmember, okay, that passes unanimously. Let's move on to ordinances on second reading and public hearings on these matters. So 9A, Ordinance 2020-02, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 14.05 of the Longmont Municipal Code regarding raw water requirement policy. Um, is there, there's nothing on any of these by staff, right? So are there any questions from council or for staff? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and open up the public hearing on Ordinance 2020-02. All right, seeing no one, let's go ahead and close the public um, hearing. Uh, can I have a motion, please? Councilmember Martin? Go ahead. Um, I move ordinance 2020, 0-2020-2. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Martin and seconded by Councilmember Christensen and also by Dr. Waters, take your pick. Um, let's go ahead and vote. All right, that passes unanimously. 9B, Ordinance 2020-03, a bill for an ordinance approving land use amendments to the Envision Longmont Multimodal and Comprehensive Plan for Housekeeping Amendments. Um, are there any questions from, from Council for staff? Seeing none, let's go ahead and open up the public hearing on Ordinance 2020-03. All right, seeing no one wanting to speak, let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Do we have a motion for Ordinance 2020-03? I'll second that. It's been moved by Dr. Waters, Ordinance 2020-03, and seconded by myself. Let's vote. That passes unanimously. Ordinance 9C, or item 9C, Ordinance 2020-04, bill for an ordinance designating Barger Nickel Home located at 719 Atwood Street as a local historic landmark. Anyone, anyone on council have questions for staff? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and open the public hearing on this ordinance. All right, seeing no one wants to speak, let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Do we have a motion? Councilmember Peck. All right, Councilmember Peck uh, moved uh, Ordinance 2020 04. It's been seconded by Dr. Waters. Let's go ahead and vote. That passes unanimously. All right, item 9D, Ordinance 2020-05, a bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the vacation of a 20-foot wide drainage outfall easement located on Lot 2 of Block 1 in the J.M. Smucker LLC plant subdivision generally located north of Highway 119 and west of Pinnacle Street. Are there any questions uh, from council for staff? All right, seeing, one, seeing none, let's go ahead and open the public hearing on Ordinance 2020-05. Anyone? All right, seeing no one, let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Can we have a motion, please? I move Ordinance 2020-05. Do I have a second? 
All right, so it was moved by myself and seconded by Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Let's vote. All right, that passes unanimously. Item 9E, Ordinance 2020-06, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the City of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport, Hangar Parcel H61, to James F. Duca, the tenant. Do we have any questions from uh, Council for Staff? All right, seeing none, uh, let's go ahead and open up the public hearing on Ordinance 2020-06. Would anyone like to speak? Seeing, no, seeing none, let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Do we have a motion? Councilmember Peck. Move ordinance. I move ordinance 202006. I'll second that. Let's go ahead and vote. Councilmember Martin, push harder. All right, that that uh, passes unanimously. All right, let's return to items removed from the consent agenda. Let's go ahead and take it in order of alphabet. 8A, Ordinance 2020-08, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the City of Longmont to execute a lease extension of real property known as 1140 Boston Avenue to Longmont Win Air Company. Councilmember Christensen. Okay, I brought this up because um, in reading over um, the LEDP thing and in view of businesses that have gone out of business in the last <laughs> month in Longmont, um, this company has been there since 2004 because of the, um, and, and, and they've built a successful business, and I don't believe people who've um, been successful should be punished for being successful. Uh, we purchased this uh, in order to, uh, the city purchased this land in order to uh, work on our uh, repair of the river corridor, which we certainly do need to do. And that was not our fault, and that was certainly not this company's fault either. It's something that was necessary. Um, as part of that, uh, half of the, the building that they were in but was occupied by creative learning uh, had to be demolished so that we could expand the river corridor and dig it deeper and wider. Um, once again, that isn't their fault. So they do want to expand, but it may take them a couple of years. Meanwhile, what we are proposing is that um, if, if they have been good tenants, I don't see why we would be charging them an extra 3% this year and an extra 3% next year. This lease is up for renewal, but they also are intending apparently to relocate. I don't know why we would make that more difficult for them by uh, charging them an extra 6% over the next two years. I would propose that we not charge them anything since they have been good tenants and um, if we want to help them, I don't see why we're charging them extra money. Uh, we could let them uh, have the same lease for two years. Have we done anything to improve the property? No, we're actually making it um, more difficult for them by kind of, you know. So I, I object to us charging them an extra 6% over the next two years. All right. And thank you, okay, Council Mayor Peck. Thank you. I have a question uh, about what was written, just actually a clarification. Uh, we did move the Creative Learning Center, and it said, according to this uh, communication, that the city followed the Federal Uniform Relocation Act procedures, um, which requires that all applicable moving expenses in any increase in rent for the next two years be paid to the party being relocated. So is the excess in this rent, the increase, going to the Creative Learning Center? No, that's no. a separate issue. Can you explain that? I didn't understand that. So what's meant by that, uh, Dale Rademacher, uh, Deputy City Manager, um, Council Member Peck, the uh, reference in our communication with, with regards to Creative Learning was to just demonstrate that the city followed the, uh, the Uniform Re Relocation Act, which is a HUD requirement when you're using HUD funding for projects, and it's to ensure that um, when people are being moved, um, um, 
uh, in a way that they didn't come up with wanting to do. In other right. words, um, that that the that their all their costs of moving and relocating are done, um, as well as covering any increase in their rents. And so we're doing that separate with creative learning. So this this action tonight is really only dealing with the second half of the building uh, that's uh, currently occupied by Winair. And that, that was what I needed to explain, that the increase in rate to Winair was not going to, uh, according to this act, to creative learning. Correct. That Correct. is, they're, they're okay. separate. And what I would say with regards to the, the lease rate, certainly, you know, staff will defer to council on what you think is appropriate. Um, I believe these 3% increases were what we felt um, was happening basically in the Longmont market. And if anything is lower than what's happening um, in a more competitive environment. And so, in, and I un fully understand what you're uh, referring to, Council Member Christensen, and I certainly support whatever the council wants to do, but um, staff really values Winair. We think they are a very good tenant. Um, we believe they very well may want to stay there, even though they want to enlarge um, uh, their their footprint in a way that may or may not be able to be uh, you know accomplished. I think the biggest benefit we are doing for them, though, is removing that building from the floodplain and protecting it with the project that we're doing. And so there's a there's an indirect benefit back to them um, to hopefully be able to stay in business if we. Um, are uh, impacted by another flood. But again, we'll defer to council on what you want to do with the, the lease rate. But, but they've agreed to this, right? Yes. Okay, so, all right. Uh, council Mayor Rodriguez, I'm sorry, Mayor President Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, what would you um, say, I don't know if you could ballpark, what generally commercial uh, lease rates have increased by over the last few years? I don't know if anybody it's has It's too answer. bad Jessica's not yeah. here. Um, I don't know, Harold, do you, do you have a sense? I, 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 it's a very tight market in Longmire right now, right. Is, is what I do know from being on the LEDP. And I, I would not be surprised if they're not increasing in the, in the 5 to 10% rate. And so then my other question would be, as this has already been, as you, I think, just answered, uh, negotiated lease terms, um, why would they have not asked for a longer lease term than two years? So the two years is one that um, we are requesting because that is the time it's going to take us to really clear this area of the RSVP, the Resilient St. Marine Project. After that two-year time frame, the city, we would then come back to the council and ask you all the question, do you want to sell this property now? And so we're, what staff is saying is that over the next two years, city, you should maintain ownership of it. Um, because we are impacting it with the project. There is no denying that. Um, there's a lot of work going on in that area. Um, after two years, the question will likely be posed to the council, do you want to sell? So we're not certain that we'll even own this property after two years necessarily. Correct. You, you, you guys are going to have the decision to make on whether you continue to own it or you sell it. And I think they're trying to figure out what they want to do to, to your question in terms of... Ring. Um, space availability I think what we can say is that generally if you look at the inventory that's quoted in some of the LEDP reports um, once you take out the max store and you look at the amount of available space I think it's less than five percent when you then call out space that they need for that high base storage it's even lower and and so I think that's part of the what's what's churning in the market okay well, seeing as that these are already essentially agreed upon lease terms that seem amenable to Winair, I would move approval of Ordinance 2008. All right, it's been moved and moved by Mayor Pro Tem and seconded by Councilmember Peck. Councilmember Martin. All right, uh, seeing no one else in the queue, let's go ahead and vote. However, but the motion is passage of 8A Ordinance 2020. Dash 08, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to execute a lease extension of real property known as 1140 Boston Avenue to the Longmont Wind Air Company. Let's vote. All right, that passes six. You want to change your vote? I have not, I have not, okay, that passes six to one um, with Councilmember Christensen uh, against. Uh, Councilmember Christensen, 8B.
And I'll just, it's resolution 2020-11, resolution yes. of Longmont City Council conditionally approving the sale or donation of property for the development of 2000 Sunset Way, Lot 2, as an affordable housing development. Yes. Uh, I think this is a wonderful project. It is exactly what we need. Um, I would like to reiterate the fact that we are the majority partners with Longmont Housing Authority. We own 59%. We are contributing $700,000 of taxpayer money uh, that went into this agreement, and we are possibly contributing an extra million dollars into this. So we definitely have the majority interest in this. Isn't that correct? Possibly. I, I, I think it's 100000 Okay, I'll take your word for it. Anyway, that's a considerable Which amount. Which is a loan that they'll repay. That's right. That is hundred thousand. Okay. Anyway, um, and um, I, I really value the work done by our real redevelopment director Tony Chacon in finding uh, this partner Elements, who does this for a living. This is a good example of what can happen when we have. A good developer who is eager to build what the city needs, which in this case is transitional housing. The, um, the former director of, uh, of the Our Center, Edwina Salazar, has said for years, both publicly and privately to me, that they can help people, but they have to have transitional housing. And we have no transitional housing. And we are now starting to build it because of the Affordable Housing Act. And this is an excellent example. However, because I am on the Longmont Housing, uh, I'm a Longmont Housing liaison, um, I would like to see the agreement, and I, I am all for this, this agreement, um, which uh, merely transfers our share over to um, elements so that they can apply for CHAPA. But I do not agree with the um, agreement with Longmont Housing Authority, which last time I saw it, um, wanted them to be receiving, a, I believe this is true, and you can confirm this, Kathy, $100,000 yearly payment for Longmont Housing Authority to administer for administrative fees. I don't think this is tenable for an affordable development or for any development. And furthermore, they are not the local experts in transitional housing. The local experts are the Our Center, Hope, Agape, and the churches who've been providing this, <coughs> particularly the congregational church that built the Micah homes. But the Our Center and Hope are, are local experts in providing housing assistance and transitional housing and resources. So I, I do not want us to sign off on any agreement that um, puts the long, I, and I'm not putting down the Longmont Housing Authority at all. That's simply not in their, uh, skill set, shall we say. Um, I, I, see how they think it would be helpful for them to administer both the suites and this, but it's really a very different population. And I do not uh, think that it would be useful for them to be administering this. Furthermore, they're burdened with many federal and state, uh, federal and state compliance issues and funding issues. Um, in addition to having several different groups of case management at the suites, which is very problematic in terms of HIPAA rules. So I, I do want us to be sure that we are not signing on to something, um, if we vote in favor of this, um, that sets up the Longmont Housing Authority as liaison, I mean, as the, um, the administrator and the manager of, these, of this, uh, um, new development. Elements came to us because they're very skilled at this, and I would like them to have the freedom to do that. 
So, um, Mayor and Council, Kathy Fedler, Housing and Community Investment Manager. Um, so this project came to us um, in a different location, and we suggested the suites as a better location because of a number of different things. Um, it's permanent supportive housing, really, as opposed to transitional housing. Um, so people can go in there and, and stay. Um, they don't necessarily move out, although with support services and some um, counseling, sometimes they are able to move up and out. Um, so this first phase is really permanent supportive housing um, that is like the suites. Um, so what this does is it gives us the ability to negotiate with Element and with the housing authority um, and the city as partners in what is this going to look at. So all um, look like. So all this does is really give, um, it gives um, Element something to go to Chaffa with for their application that says, yes, we're all willing to sit down and talk about this and we're gonna reach an agreement. If we reach an agreement, we are moving forward. So everything is still to be negotiated. What we've talked about with the housing authority that you alluded to is that there are some economies of scale in management of the two properties, since they would be close together, as well as support services for the two properties that would be close together. And that LHA is more um, in their wheelhouse to do property management and not so much support services where Boulder Shelter for the Homeless is doing support services in a number of different locations throughout the county and could do it in, for um, this project as well and if they took over this, the suite support services. So you're realigning to get people doing things that are more within their wheelhouse, <laughs> which is, is really what we want um, all the way around. Um, the fees are to be negotiated around that still. I know, you know, there's some talk about what people would like to see, but until we sit down and really hash it through, we, we don't have that established yet. So really it's about aligning um, um, skills uh, with where they are best um, able to support both projects. And again, we're only talking about this one phase that's at the top right. north west corner of the property. Eventually there may be more phases throughout the property, but right now it's just the one. And I even talked to the, the developer about <clears throat> can we just pull off this one property because they have to put each one in a separate corporation for tax credits, so we might be able to just talk about this one piece of property, pull it off from the rest of the lot, subdivide it in, hmm. in essence, so that each phase stands on its own. Because if um, the other phases have a little bit higher incomes that they're serving, maybe they could pay something for the land as mm -hmm. well as doing the, the property management and the support services. So, so it's still mm -hmm. pretty up in the air <laughs> um, and something okay. that we're going to tr be working through in the next month to get them but, finalized. But we do have to sign over the land so that Chaffa can, ag can agree to, element, to loan or to give money to not, not until we reach a full agreement and it comes back to council for approval. Oh, I this is just an interim we step. This gets them in the door through the application process and is acceptable for Chaffa to consider the application. But we're going to have to reach a, f a formal agreement that's approved by LHA board and by the city council um, sometime before they will actually issue the tax credits. I thought they if had they're to approved. apply by, the, by February 3rd. They have to su submit their application okay. by February 3rd, but this, agree this um, resolution and the letter from the city attorney is sufficient for the application. Oh. Okay, that's good. That's better. That gives us a lot more time. Uh, Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. <clears throat> I'll just disclose I'm going to try to figure out which hat I'm wearing here uh, as an LHA board member sitting in here as a council member. Uh, I just need to ask uh, Council Member Christensen, I, 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 I'm trying to understand what you just said about LHA as the property manager. Uh, were you suggesting LHA, we would not want LHA to be the manager of affordable housing? Council Member Christensen. That's right, I'll just keep... Clear. I thought our agreement was with elements to do that. 
But I mean, I just don't want us to sign off on something without discussing this at some kind of length. To have, it seemed to me that we were going to be signing off on whatever LHA <coughs> agreed to without actually come, having it come before us and discuss. And that isn't, as, as Kathy said, that isn't the case. So I've misunderstood what we were signing off on tonight. Okay. Do you want to make Does a motion? Oh, sorry. Oh, Councilmember Peck. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I just be, because we just had some, some comments about LHA. People ought to know LHA is managing eight properties right in the city, uh, and uh, and managing those um, I think successfully. Uh, by the way, when I was I was going to comment on this last item where we're talking about. Uh, uh, rent rates and or lease rates. Um, I, we are seeing a slight, I think, a four percent increase in LHA rates uh, going into the as 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 leases come due. So what we just did in the last item is consistent with that. But LHA um, is managing our affordable units now, uh, not transitional, permanent for most of the residents, both in the suites and as um, as seniors. Uh, the LHA board is very excited about this project. Elements is a developer. They're not the property manager. That they're not the developer. And, I, and I'd, have to, I'd raise serious questions if we thought that at the Hour Center or Hope or anybody else was going to manage these properties on this site because those aren't property managers for certain. So um, I, think this, I think this comes together. This is a terrific opportunity. It's absolutely consistent with, I think, with the vision that we had as a public-private partnership when we bought that land from LHA so they could close on the construction loan, actually they could close on Fall River and convert the construction loan at the suites. I mean, we did a, we stepped up in a big way, but it is the best and highest use of the money that we budgeted for affordable housing. So uh, I think this is absolutely consistent. I'm, it's fun to see it come back, a vision with the right kind of partners and, um, and to help move them along to get access to those tax credits. Councilman Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I just have one question, um, and probably Karen can answer this. Why is the Boulder Shelter providing the services, um, and are they going to have a local office in order to do that, the wraparound services? Mm -hmm. So, um, like I said, they are doing that under several different grants with the state and um, um, with the veterans. Um, Affairs Commission, I, I, administration, Depart VA. administration, thank you. <laughs> um, so they are doing that um, throughout the county, actually. They have properties, well, the Lee Hill property in Boulder. They've got properties um, that they're doing that here in Longmont already in scattered site um, areas and um, throughout the, the county. Um, I think it's over 90 different units that they've got um, that they're currently providing those support services. So they have moved into that arena in a pretty big way and are actually quite successful at it. Are, are they working out of the hub on Kaufman? Um, or do the, my concern is um, these residents having to travel to Boulder? For no, 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 yeah. no. The case managers come to them. They Perfect. have case yeah. managers that are assigned to, to the different um, projects okay. and developments. It, that it, answered it. And yeah. then also as a, as a point of reference when this, um, came to Kathy's attention and she brought it to my attention. I actually asked to schedule a meeting um, with everyone we've mentioned, in addition to our center, in between, Hope, who else? VCP. VCP, and, okay. and said, everyone, let's come together. This is a really good opportunity, and how do we work as a collective to support this and bring it forward and how do we use it to start supporting the other things that we're doing mm -hmm. and so when we talk about this there is other conversations going okay. to have a more robust impact and specifically how do you look at the transitional housing for example that VCP is working on and we needing potentially more permanent supportive which when you start doing that you start creating more capacity so this is really a product of multiple conversations and looking at a much bigger picture. This is one piece. Okay. The other thing I think that when we use terms and, and so when we talk facility management and we talk support services, I think those are two different concepts and 
And it's like I often say, if we're good at managing buildings and, and maintaining those buildings, and that's what we're good at, but we may not necessarily be the best at the programming, and the support services is really that programming piece, and that's why we're trying to get everyone in the lanes that they excel at. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. All right. Would someone like to make a motion? Councilor Perpec? Let's see. Which one was it? It um, was B. 9B, Resolution 202011. Uh, I move Resolution 2020-11. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Peck, seconded by Councilmember Martin. Seeing no further discussion, let's vote. Oops, I would, uh, Mayor Bagley, push harder. All right, now it passes unanimously. All right. 8C, uh, Resolution 2020-12, a resolution of Longmont City Council approving a voluntary alternative agreement for the Sugar Mill Paired Homes Development in satisfaction of the city's inclusionary housing requirements. Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Just a couple of questions. I, um, this, is, this is an interesting project from several different perspectives from my standpoint. Um, and I'm, I, I spoke to David a bit at the break, and uh, it would be helpful for me if, if he could talk about how, what's the approach that Habitat takes to make certain that if this gets approved, that those 12 lots, that, that he's confident in the development of those lots, and um, what, what's the method for keeping mortgage or the co total cost, right, of, uh, of home ownership uh, affordable, permanently affordable for the residents, whether or not uh, the developer gets a metro district approved. Sure. Uh, David Emerson, I'm the executive director for Habitat for Humanity of St. Brain Valley, um, council member Waters. Uh, so we control the financing, uh, the long and short of that is so we uh, factor in any HOA fees, any metro district fees, um, property taxes and insurance. And we make sure that that amount does not amount to more than 27% of a person's income, which is actually well below uh, other guidelines. Um, most guidelines are well, you know, at least 30%. Um, so right from the beginning, we know what, um, you know, what that mortgage is gonna be for the homeowner. Um, and because we control the financing, it really shouldn't matter whether that Metro District is in place or not. Um, we did look at uh, Mountain Brook, for example, and just did a little bit of, uh, you know, we're not in the Metro District for Mountain Brook, but at a 50 mil uh, um, rate, if you will, uh, our houses will probably be around $200,000. Um, that's around $68 a month if it was applied that full Metro District. Um, so again, we would back that out and our um, principal payments would, uh, uh, add up to um, not more than 27%. So regardless, uh, you, you could do the same thing with an HOA. We would have to. Yeah, yeah. I just think it's, it's instructive for me at least to understand Metro District or not, HOA or not, right. that is unrelated when Habitat's involved to whether or not homes are permanently affordable. Right. Yeah, which is part of the, the beauty of what you bring into the equation. Um, so uh, given the fact that we've had this discussion about metro districts, I just think it's important to understand that's separate from what we're doing with our affordable housing initiative. And then I'll be quiet. I, um, I'm, gonna be, I'm supportive of this, of this proposal, and I'll listen to the concerns or questions of others. Hey, Harold, when, when's, uh, when's the metro district discussion? On the 4th, right? You wanted it at the next study session, so that'll be February All right, 4th. so we're, we're popping into the queue here, and we... Uh, we, we got the battle coming up, so. All right, Council Mayor Christensen. Um, I would like Eugene to explain the legal definition of dedication of this land. Does that mean that, that Habitat for Humanity, for instance, owns the land outright? They have a title to it, they can sell it. Or does that mean it is leased for a dollar a year or something like that? So med, uh, dedication means it is donated and put in their control, in their name, and then we enter into an agreement with Habitat separately. Um, mm -hmm. The 
developer enters into agreement with Habitat about what happens. And if anything would happen to Habitat, the land, it's going to go in the agreement, the land comes back to the city. So there will be full control. There will be covenants on the property, um, and it'll be deed restricted. But it's in Habitat's name at the point of donation. They own it and they can yes. sell it. Yes. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. I, I am curious as to how this qualifies for a voluntary alternative agreement. We, this was supposed to be something very, very rare, and we've had about three applications for this now in the last six months. Yes. So this one is, falls under the um, alternative agreement because of the land donation. The code right now says the land is dedicated to the city. Mm -hmm. So to allow it to be dedicated directly to Habitat, that's why we have to have the voluntary alternative agreement. We are going to be bringing back um, some tweaks and changes to the code, probably yet this quarter. Um, and this, that would be one of them to, to change that so we don't have to keep bringing this back. But what would keep a developer from setting up their own uh, charity or making an agreement with a charity? I mean, to me, I, I see the um, efficacy in just transferring it directly to Habitat. And Habitat, of course, is a wonderful organization. But... Uh, this undermines our inclusionary housing in that right now it is the land is given to the city and the city gives it to a genuine charity such as Habitat for Humanity. What would prevent this if we, if we start doing this and just transferring it directly to a charity from the developer to the charity, what is to prevent the, chari the developer from creating their own charity that they donate their own land to? So there was discussion about this during the inclusionary housing um, code writing. <laughs> yes. um, and um, I think there was an, a couple of different things that were, were mentioned. That was a concern um, yes. by some council, which I think is why we ended up with it going to the city. Yes. Um, and the previous um, inclusionary housing ordinance, we um, got around that by saying that the nonprofit or the charity, whatever you want to call it, had to be approved by the city. And there were certain, we set up ramifications or certain criteria of how that could be met. Um, it's a little bit burdensome to put it in the code, but it could go in guidelines or something like that. Um, or you could just limit it to a number of specific Longmont-based organizations, nonprofits that um, would be acceptable. Yes, we could, or we could just follow the ordinance. And that's what you have here. <laughs> so yeah. we can keep bringing them back, too. So Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you. I, I think if I'm remembering the conversation, that's the very reason it has to come back in the voluntary alternative agreement is because you did want that open-ended component where it could be any charity and council wanted to review that, which is why it's coming back in this form. Councilmember Peck. I guess I'm uh, still a little bit confused because um, in the ordinance, it would just be land in lieu, you know, instead of uh, providing the 12% the affordable housing. Once the city owns it, they can have anyone develop it. This, this feels convoluted to me because we're bringing in a lot of different aspects. Um, you know, and the Metro District thing to me isn't even worth considering at this point because um, we don't have a service plan. We don't have anything for that Metro District. So um, this whole paragraph doesn't to me doesn't relate. I don't, I still don't understand and I didn't when we created the ordinance as to why we can't just follow the ordinance. It's either land in lieu or cash in lieu. And if it's land in lieu, then the city can choose the developer. Um, in this, you know, the, the writing in the, in the uh, proposed development says this will make the transaction easier and cleaner than dedicating the parcels to the city and we in turn dedicate them to habitat i don't i don't understand why it would be cleaner to do it this way um, and primarily because the developer 
had the um, conversations and everything with Habitat directly. So the developer wants to donate directly to Habitat versus going through the city. And this, this is kind of what we're finding this with Mountain Brook was the same thing. They wanted to go directly to Habitat and to Veterans Community Project as opposed so to going through the city. So they just did the, the work for, for the city, actually, looking for getting the developer for the, the land they wanted to donate. I understand that part of it. Yeah. Okay, so if they've already reached that agreement, it is easier <laughs> to have them donate directly to them versus going to the city and the city turning around and and donating it. If it was a more open process, then absolutely we would be saying donate it to the city and we'll make it, you know, we'll do what needs to be done to have it happen. I guess, I guess going forward, I, I don't want every development to come back to us with a different uh, model, I would say, for what they want to do um, than what our inclusionary zoning ordinance actually says. So, uh, I'll, I'll agree to this, but not with the uh, metro district consideration in it. Because it, it doesn't it make is any not. sense. It is not. It was only yeah. meant, the metro district was only mentioned that if it would happen to go forward, there's a mechanism with Habitat to keep the units affordable. It's not going to impact that. So it isn't a consideration at all, and it's not a vote at all about the metro district. Okay, great. It was just an explanation. And, and I just want to make... Um, this statement because I do understand Habitat for Humanity and how they build. Um, what they are doing, they do regardless. This is this is their model with the financing, with interviewing the families and working with them for a year before they even get into the homes to make sure they can afford them. So it doesn't, you know, this isn't anything that the developer is uh, constructing. That finance plan has been Habitat's model for years. Yep. So. Um, that part of it I totally agree with. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I was just wondering in our ordinance, do we say that when the land donation occurs that it's strictly a 12% land donation is sufficient to, to uh, accomplish the, the requirements by ordinance that the developer has? Or is it nondescript in our ordinance as far mm, as? I think that's a gist. Mayor and Council, Eugene May, City Attorney. Uh, the ordinance provides the land must be able to support at least the quantity of affordable housing as would it be required on site without the need for variance. So essentially 12% yeah. would satisfy as long as it can contain 12% of the units. Right. Okay. Um, well, that's helpful to know. And, you know, I do consider this in the sense that developers and builders are two different things. And that uh, whether the Per, the builder of the other units builds the affordable units is not really the point. The point is getting the units built regardless of who the builder happens to be. So I don't really have a problem. And, of course, you know, the reputation that Habitat has is great. I do have a quick question as for Habitat. Do you commonly construct interior roadways? Um, yes, we ha not commonly, but we have had to do that in order to make projects work. So um, it just depends. Uh, obviously, ideally... We would uh, rather have um, all the infrastructure in place, um, but when I started to work with the, um, the developer, we really worked in good faith with what the code says, that the infrastructure needed to be up to that, uh, that edge of the land donation. Um, you know, and if I may take a minute here, one of the things that uh, you may consider, uh, I, I'm hearing, you know, it may be better to have the city, it donated to the city and then find the builder. There's a lot of back and forth that is going on between engineering, architecture, the market rate builder, the developer, the investors. And so um, in this case, the developer really needed to understand who the builder of that affordable was going to be. And so to, to push that to the end, I think would be problematic um, to getting some of this affordable done. So when this, my understanding um, is when this land gets dedicated to habitat or any affordable, if it wasn't habitat, there would be a deed put on that land immediately, one. And second, the market rate builder would not be able to pull uh, or receive COs unless um, the developer has done their duty. So the, the, it's really um, the,
based on the term sheet, uh, a lot of the, the mechanics have been thought out to ensure that the affordable is done well. So. Thank you. Uh, I would move resolution 2020-12. Councilmember, Councilmember Martin. All right, let's go ahead and vote. You're voting on, there's a motion for resolution 2020-12. Councilmember Christensen. All right, that passes unanimously. All right, that gets us through the consent agenda as well as ordinances on second reading. Uh, Harold, when are, just out of curiosity, uh, when are we going to be out of here? When's our first meeting in the library? Next week, right? Okay, all right, so. Huh? That, that, no, I know, that's why I figured, which is why I was like, if it was gonna be two weeks, I was like, get us a clock, but uh, all right. So uh, it is nine o'clock, uh, should we take a five minute break again? Are you doing okay? No? All right. Let's go to general business. First quarter 2020 affordable housing funding recommendations for consideration and approval. Hidden under here. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So tonight we are looking at um, the recommendations from the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board. Um, via recommendations of the technical review group on funding for several different um, projects, affordable housing projects from the Affordable Housing Fund, as well as from the CDBG Fund, even though you're really going to be looking at and acting on the CDBG program um, next month in, uh, on the 20, February 25th meeting. Um, oh, this is going to be hard to, sorry. I pulled this together quickly. So this is attachment two in your packet, and it summarizes the different projects um, that we received applications for. So the first one is the Boulder County Housing Authority for the Kaufman Street Project. Um, if you remember, that one um, has received tax credit funding from CHAFA. Um, it is um, to do 73 total units, um, with a good portion of them, uh, 12, 15, 23 of the units, um, at 50% um, AMI or below, 12 of the units at 30% AMI, and 50 units at 60% and below. Um, it does have some three-bedroom units, um, but mostly ones and twos. Um, <clears throat> uh, they um, are also receiving other city funding to help with the parking <coughs> garage that um, is a joint project with the LDDA. Um, they requested funding um, for the housing portion of it, and the Housing Advisory Board is recommending that the 2021 home funds that the city is um, eligible to receive would be um, given to this project as a grant. Um, they would also be eligible for about $200,000 in fee offsets from the Affordable Housing Fund. Um, <clears throat> the Element Property um, Project, the Suite su Permanent Supportive Housing Project, um, requested $100,000 um, for pre-development costs, so to help them with their engineering, with their um, um, due diligence, the soil surveys, and, and those kinds of things that they have to do in order to know um, that they've got uh, good land in order to move forward with. Um, it's being recommended that that be in a, a loan for those costs, 0% interest with a two-year um, payment in two years, whether or not the project goes forward and is funded by CHAFA or not. So we would get the $100,000 back. This would be a 9% um, low-income housing tax credit um, project, and as um, Councilmember Christensen um, indicated, the application is due to CHAFA by February 3rd. Um, the first phase would be 50 to 60, probably closer to 50 permanent supportive housing units, um, mostly one bedroom. Um, with a lower income mix um, at the 30%. Additional phases may be moving forward um, as well. The next project that was considered is the in-between. Um, they requested funding to be able to go out and uh, look for and then ultimately purchase an existing um, property that they would then convert to affordable. Um, because uh, we didn't know what property they were talking about, the Technical Review Group and the Housing Advisory Board um, are recommending um, some funding, not the full amount that they requested, 
um, $100,000 from the Affordable Housing Fund as a loan with 0% interest, and they would uh, match their financing term for their uh, mortgage because they're going to have to get a mortgage in order to do this. Um, and then up to 160000 additional from the 2020 CDBG funds as a grant. Um, there's some caveats on it. Um, the funding needs to be spent within 12 months of the city uh, council approval. The building to be purchased can have no fewer than six units. So the technical review group was very interested in making sure that it was a, a um, significant project um, for them, so at least six. They're really trying to look at eight to 15, um, and that have at least one fully accessible unit or a unit that's able to be made fully accessible. Um, and they would have to show that they do have permanent financing or a line of credit or some kind of bridge loan before we would release our funds to move forward with the purchase. Um, the Longmont Family Apartments is a, another project that we received. This is a new developer um, to the uh, city. Um, constructing 88 units of affordable housing. Um, 18 of the units would be affordable, actually 22 of the units would be affordable at or below 50%, which is about 25% of the total units, and the rest at 60%. Um, this would have a lot of three bedrooms and four bedrooms, so truly family housing. Um, 27 three bedroom, 16 four bedroom, and 30 accessible units, so more than the minimum required there. Um, it would be a $500,000 loan from the Affordable Housing Fund with 0% interest during construction and then um, the rate set um, at um, when they close on the um, at, to their permanent financing with a 15-year term but amortized over 38 years. So it would be refinanced when the tax credits um, would come up. Uh, we, this is when we did, rene we did negotiate further with the developer in order to get lower income units, um, so I think that worked out well. They would also be eligible for, we're estimating, around 215000 in fee waiver um, offsets to be paid from the Affordable Housing Fund. This project has received um, approval from CHAFA for tax credits as well as private activity bonds. <coughs> the Longmont Housing Authority um, made a request. Whoops. Um, to for Aspen Meadows apartment senior apartments, that project um, is up for um, resyndication. Um, the tax credits have expired on that one, so they're looking to recredit it and do a, a significant rehab on that building. Um, they've been approved for one hundred seventy-five thousand in twenty nineteen. City of Longmont CDBG funds already. They also received um, our, um, some of our private activity bond in 2019, and council did approve all of the 2020 um, private activity bond to go to this project as well. Um, we are suggesting or recommending a $300,000 grant from the 2020 CDBG fund um, to go with that 175, so I'll give them a total of 475,000 in grant funds. Um, the configuration stays the same with 47 one-bedroom and three two-bedroom, but um, it does get to some lower income units um, with five would be dedicated to 30% AMI and below, um, most of them at 50 and then five at 60. So it spreads it out a little bit more and allows for some of those lower income units. And then finally, senior housing options, which owns the Cinnamon Park um, assisted living um, facility has got a little bit of land that they want to build a um, independent living, uh, 25 units for independent seniors. Um, they are going to be also submitting four tax credits in the February round. Um, <coughs> we are recommending a $250,000 affordable housing fund loan, which would be at 0% interest for a 40-year term. It would be contingent on them being approved for the tax credits in this round. So if they don't get approved, then we don't give them the funding, obviously. Um, they would also be eligible for um, about 60000 in offsets, we're estimating at this time. Um, the 25 units would all be accessible. Um, 21 of them would be one bedroom and four um, studios. Um, three of the units at 30% AMI and nine at 40% and the rest at 50%. So all, excuse me, um, below 50% AMI. So I was hoping this would be a little bit easier to read, but again, it's um, in your packet. Um, so it just really lays out 
the funding that's being recommended and what funding source um, is being recommended to come from, as well as giving you um, information on um, the fund sources, so what we have available. So um, we are looking at um, allocating 1.425 million, including holding out some of those fee offsets um, from the, uh, the 2020 Affordable Housing Fund. Um, we ab have about 2.25 million available to us right now with carryover into, from 2019 into 2020, the new funds anticipated in 2020. So that's gonna leave us with about 800,000 available for the rest of 2020. Um, we don't think we need to do, we definitely don't need to do a funding application in this first quarter. We may not need to do it in the next quarter, depending on what we hear from Chaffa for um, the different projects. So probably not looking to doing um, applications again until June, July timeframe. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to take a shot at giving some answers. Uh, let's go with Councilman Rudalgo Faring. Thank you. Um, so in looking at, um, and primarily, and I don't know how, how many on council are um, familiar with the Longmont family um, apartments, the 15th Street Avenue, how, how much background. So the last few months and through my campaign, I was um, kind of walking the area, talking to, to neighbors. So I had been aware of this, um, you know, the concerns, and primarily around the density and the parking. Um, some big concerns that came to light was looking at the um, public right-of-way. And so in, in discussing with Harold, we talked about that this particular project wouldn't impact. Um, but you are working with um, engineers as the redevelopment in that area happens to redesign, reconfigure, so no homes are in jeopardy. Yeah, so this goes to the conversation we had with the lady that came to council last yes. week regarding 16th Street, yeah. and we yeah. and we talked about the fact that in terms and Joni, if I misspeak, jump in. Mm -hmm. At this time, 16th Street wasn't going to be required, but we also have mm -hmm. the engineers looking at alternate designs in order mm -hmm. to accommodate that and not mm -hmm. negatively impact the um, mobile home park. Okay. So, so yes. Okay, and That's what so we're working on. they're working on it. So they haven't come up with a, a design or a, um, a solution yet. They may have. I know Jim and Dell and I were talking about it, and Joni's talking about it. So I know that Dell asked Jim to have his folks work on that and look at it. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't had a chance to circle back on that one, but okay. that's on our list to keep up with. To keep up with. Yep. So. So yeah, so in looking at this, and so what we're approving tonight is not necessarily approval for any of these projects to move forward. It is for, go ahead, <laughs> for um, funding and? It is for funding so that project would move forward. It's actually um, submitted for development review. Okay, so the development. So it has to go through all that first. Uh, so the development review and the, the um, appropriation of funds for this are two separate mm -hmm. things? Okay, yes. um, and so the other thing, if for some reason in this, um, for the 88 units, if the developer decides to, to roll back the number of units, drop it down to 50 or, or something more comparable to the, the area, um, would they still qualify for the funding? So it would be negotiable for our funding, but because they have received their approvals from Chaffa, Mm -hmm. um, and it's a significant amount of money. I doubt if they could go back and renegotiate that at this point. I don't know if somebody's here from the developer um, or not, mm -hmm. but um, that I highly doubt that Chaffa would approve a, a drop mm -hmm. from 88 to 50. Okay, okay, or even 60 or, or what, right. yeah, so just any Because they'd have to below. underwrite the entire thing. It would delay okay. the whole thing. And, um, yeah. and I guess my concern, because I had been walking around that area. I dragged my husband, who's a contractor, and I was like, come with me, and we're going to scope the neighborhood. And I was hoping I wouldn't get arrested but <laughs> for scoping around. But it is really, it is a dense property um, project. And it will alter, permanently alter the area. Um, and then I looked at the nearest park, so I was looking that up too. Spangler Park would be the closest public park 
to where they're um, from this development. Yeah, I looked it up on my phone. I think it was Car Park, um, Spangler. Is it? I, I, thought Alta, I thought Alta was closer, but oh, I could maybe be wrong. I'm looking the wrong. It's maybe it didn't show up on mine. It's like ninth and eighteenth or ninth and so ninth. I think it's yeah. north and so ninth, tenth, eleventh. So, but it's on the other side of the cemetery. So it's south of the cemetery. So yeah. So then the nearest one then would be from this vicinity, um, Spangler Park. Um, so just kind of looking at you know, what our Envision plan is, we're looking at creating more walkability, more paths, bike paths, um, accessibility, parks. I just, I, I'm having a hard time uh, accepting this particular project or approval for this particular project to move forward um, until there are other, it seems like there, there are other things, including look talking with engineers around the public right of way to ensure that people aren't displaced, um, looking at how we can build up the infrastructure in that area in regards to park and, and walkability, bike path. Um, there just seems to be like there needs to be other things that happen first before we move through with this. So the funding will not be provided until they're ready to construct, which means they have gone through the development approval process. Um, which takes all of those things that you had talked about into consideration. Mm -hmm. I know they've done a significant amount of work to reconfigure the buildings to have less of a, a, an impact um, mm -hmm. on the neighborhood. Um, so that seems significant work they've done. But the developer needs to get their financing aligned in order to have some assurity of going through with the cost of the development process mm -hmm. um, and all that entails as well. So it's kind of a... It's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing yeah. of what comes first. From their standpoint, they have to have their financing aligned or set up or have some assurance around that in order to proceed into the development process. Um, but then most funding, well, no funding is going to happen unless they get their plans approved. Mm -hmm. So there's some, I guess, confidence there on, on that end that if, it, if they don't make it through the development review to approval, so he's going to give them any funding. <laughs> uh -huh. So, but if there is funding for this project to go through, is there a guarantee that they, there will be um, money put in place, or would they would be able to help us work with um, park pathways? I mean, this is kind of like my. Well, um, that's all part of the development process. So okay. they talk about what yeah. greenways might be needed or pocket parks that are mm -hmm. needed on site, detention. I mean, that whole realm of things is all part of the development review process. Mm -hmm. And I think what we'll have to do is um, we have a parks and greenway master plan that's really looking at what we have in terms of existing parks, where we have gaps within our system, and, and, and times all of that out in terms of how we make the public investment into to that piece. Um, I'm trying to pull that map up, but that may be something Mm -hmm. separate that we need to go over with you in terms of that piece because mm -hmm. that is a different question that's guided by that planning document in terms of what we do and, and when we do those things. Mm -hmm. okay. Councilmember Christensen. Uh, I, would, I would support all of these um, Programs, I, uh, all of this funding, I think it's all a very good idea. I do, I know we're getting a little far off when, in discussing the um, the um, 15th and Ash project, but I would, I, I do have a suggestion that I was thinking about the last few days having to do with what you just said, Councilman uh, Hidalgo Faring. Um, you know, we don't, the Envision Longmont plan is a guiding document, it is not a binding document. and. But it also suggests we ha create walkable neighborhoods, not drivable neighborhoods, walkable neighborhoods. And with that in mind, a path um, creates a much lower impact on a community and also a much more enjoyable uh, um, part of a civic uh, amenity than a street. And we don't really, we've gone for 150 years without a street that runs all the way through from 16th to Main. 
why not create a walking path along there, along that edge of the properties that everyone could enjoy? There's already one uh, on the edge of um, Mayor Bagley's property, and um, that's, that's pleasant. People can hang around there and have lunch. It's not very wide, but it's pleasant, and it wouldn't have the nearly the effect of um, everything, and it could be rolled into the landscaping requirement that everybody already has. Instead of uh, working on a road that goes through to Main Street, how about a walking bike path that goes through to Main Street? Just a suggestion. Councilmember Peck. I move that we approve the projects proposed for the 2020 affordable housing funding. I'll second that. So moved by Councilmember Peck, seconded by myself. I just want to throw in there, I do have, I don't know what walking path you're referring to, Councilmember Peck, or Christian said, but yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So, so I actually office there and I am extremely sensitive to this area. I look at it all the time, literally. Um, the uh, 15th, and uh, I mean, I would love 15th to stay just like it is, but there is no traffic on 15th. I walk every day with Drago to, uh, get, uh, to get Chipotle's, to get Five Guys. You can walk to the, there's, there's the, there's the grocery store right across the street. There's a gas station. I mean, there's, it is, I mean, it's only two blocks away. I mean, it's literally, they could walk to my office in probably 90 seconds and then walk the walk I do for lunch, which is, you know, five to 10 minutes to get pretty much anywhere. So I know this is coming up, but, um, and I don't, I'm not saying that I haven't, I have not, uh, I have no idea what they're planning. I, I know that there's affordable housing requirements. I know there's concern about the roadway going to Main Street. Um, I know that there's some density concerns. Um, I use that field to play fetch with my dog. If we could keep it empty forever, I'm all in. But the reality is, I mean, it, 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 it's going to get developed. And if it's going to get developed, I want to make sure that we, we, use these, we, we, we use these monies wisely. Uh, Council Member Hidalgo Farring, you can have the last word on whatever you're going to say. That's all right. Yeah, I can't let this go. So, um, well, and, and I'm, I look at, I don't have a problem with the affordable housing. I don't have the problem with the idea. I think it's just my, my piece is where it's at. Um, and, you know, can I make a motion that we do the, we approve the rest, extract the number three, the Longmont family apartments for now. You could, or, you could, you could make a motion. I make because a motion. Because you're new, I'll be nice. You Thank make, you. You could make a, you could make a motion. <laughs> there is, but you could make it. You I know. Make can a I you amend? Could, you could make a motion to amend. Yes. Uh, the current yeah. motion to remove the fifteenth. I'd uh, like to make a friendly Fifteenth Avenue family apartment yeah. project. It would have to be seconded, and then it would have to vote be be voted on by a majority to get it to. Yeah. I un yeah, no, so I understand that amendment. piece. I'm going to make the amendment um, that we approve the uh, to make an amendment to, was it Joan that you, um, so Council Member um, Peck, um, to extract the Longmont family apartments for now, for now, and approve, continue with the rest um, until we can, I can collect further information. Okay, it dies second? for lack of second, oh, okay. but that is. But we have a. Okay. Trust me, yeah. we're going to talk a lot about this we property. Will. Yes. All right. So let's go ahead and vote. Mm -hmm. All right. That passes six to one with a very defiant but caring council member Hidalgo Faring. That's 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 why, that's why we have ward. That's why we have wards. That's why we have wards. You're you're doing you're doing what you need to do for your peoples. Yeah, that's great. Good for you. Faring is caring. There you go. That's right. They're gonna love you. All right. Um, let's move on to 2020 legislative update. I'm sorry, Kathy. Do you have something else? Oh, I was just gonna thank the Housing Advisory Board and the Technical Review Group for all of their work during this. And I think you'll notice in the. Uh, the information we put in the packet, there was a lot more detailed review of the financials and the project variables. So, and, 
And I, we the, tried the, to step it up a little bit. And thanks to you and the staff, my head hurts reading this. I, I had the I had the thought, oh my gosh, I, I mean, I helped, you know, I was involved in the ordinance, ordinances and keeping this all straight and figuring out how much money we have left and what's coming in and what's not coming in and where our goals are and what we what's going to make us mad and not mad. Good job. <laughs> that, that was a feat. You're Impressive. Welcome. All right, let's go on to the legislative update. Sandy Cedar. Assistant City Manager right. in the flesh. Mayor Bagley, members of council, Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager, and I'm bringing you a first stack of bills to take a look at today. There are 10 bills on this list, but I should mention to you that House Bill 20-1070 concerning the requirement that local governments interface with oil and gas operations compensate persons damaged by that interference was PI'd in committee yesterday. So that one is already gone. Don't You don't need to take a position on that one. Uh, we can do this a couple ways. I can go through them and explain the different bills, or if you'd like to approve them as a batch based on the recommendations from from staff, uh, that would work well also. Councilmember Peck. Thank you. Sandy, could you read the titles of them for the people watching at home at least? So yes. They'll know what we're voting on. Yes, you bet. The and the recommendations. You got it. Okay, so the first one, this is really the biggest batch of them because this is the first month of the legislature, and we just kind of get going at this time. Uh, but House Bill 201006 concerning a creation of a statewide program of early childhood mental health co consultation. Um, because this is a council work plan priority, the staff recommends that the council supports um, 20 1006. House Bill 20 1011 concerning the creation of the Helping Others Manage Early Childhood Act, similarly, um, does. Uh, funds a public awareness campaign for early childhood education and particularly home care um, because this again is something that the that supports the council work plan for early care and education we recommend that the city council support 1011 house bill 201045 considering the stabilization of state funding for energy efficiency improvement programs um, what this bill basically does is it it uh, refunds a lot of the different programs that the state cut over the last few years including weatherization programs and such. Because this supports the city's sustainability programs and goals, we recommend that the, ha that the city council support 1045. 1070 is the one that was um, PI'd. I forget what that stands for again. <laughs> but killed in committee, essentially. Postponed indefinitely. There we go. Um, House Bill 20-1097, concerning the ability to use water that has been adjudicated for municipal use in interconnected treated municipal water supply systems, even if the historical consumptive use of the water right has been quantified in previous change of water right. This would basically protect some of the water rights that we have today and allow us not to have to go to court every single time. Um, so because this is supportive of our current water rights, the, we, are so we are recommending that the City Council supports 1097. House Bill 201151, concerning the expansion of authority of regional transportation improvements. This basically authorizes um, training plans, tr transportation planning organizations to exercise the powers of a regional transportation authority. It's sort of unclear what this might mean in the long run, um, but essentially because it would give some more powers in some more places, um, and transportation is a, is a um, priority to the city council, we recommend that you support 1151. Senate Bill 20-10, concerning the repeal of prohibition of local government regulation on plastics. This is a bill we thought we would see last year, but essentially right now, if you wanted to regulate plastics in Longmont, you cannot. There's a state preemption um, against that. This would remove that preemption so that you have more local control. So supports local control, supports environmental policies, so the, so the staff recommends city council support. Senate Bill 10. Senate Bill 20-44, concerning the allocation of sales and use tax revenue to provide additional funding for state, county, and municipal roads and ridge projects. So what this does is this basically pulls from other areas yet unknown and unidentified and, be, and is able to put that into transportation projects. So we would support that because cities would certainly get a portion of that, but it's sort of unclear where that money would come from because there's no additional revenue source. Nonetheless, we, we uh, certainly understand the priority of transportation to the city council. And staff recommends that we support 44. Senate Bill 20-55, concerning the expansion of market mechanisms for further development of recycling. As you all know, there's been issues with marketing recycling um, and being able to actually get payback and make that economically viable. So this would really do some additional, this would provide for additional research on market studies for recycling markets to see if there's other places that we could um, hopefully sell our recycled products to. 
uh, because it supports the sustainability goals for waste reduction and diversion. Um, the staff recommends that council supports Senate Bill 55. And last but not least, Senate Bill 20-94, concerning the imposition of additional plug-in electric motor vehicle registration fees. This bill would basically say that there would be an additional registration fee for electric vehicles, since that's not the direction that we think <laughs> electric vehicles should go and might be a disincentive to people actually getting electric vehicles. Staff is recommending that City Council oppose Senate Bill 94. There are a couple more that hit over the last week that you'll be seeing next week, including a brand new one that we just saw today on the original transportation district um, and some additional regulations around their operation, including auditing and some other things. So you'll be seeing that one next week. Councilmember Martin. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I move that the council support the recommendations of the staff on all the bills presented. It's been moved and seconded. Nobody's in the queue. Let's vote. All right, that passes unanimously. Thank you, Mayor. Let's move on to final call. Public invited to be heard. Anyone want to say anything? I see some staff members. We never hear from staff. Anybody want to just launch into us? Be cool. Something new. Dale, sure. All right. All right. Seeing no one, let's go ahead and move on to Mayor and Council comments. Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, everyone is, I hope, aware of the fact that uh, we have we are uh, we are in the phase of a library feasibility study where uh, we're, uh, we, there is now a survey uh, to which residents can respond if they have uh, if they'd like to. Bo there's both opportunities for responses to questions and short answer responses. Um, and and uh, Sandy, what would be the best if anybody's listening? The best way. Uh, I can I can give the URL or the uh, it's HTTP the bit.ly slash library future would be the URL so if anybody's listening or could they can they get there to engage Longmont or they could just go to engage Longmont and click on the library survey and have a chance to respond there are also three community meetings that are or four community meetings that are scheduled February 10th 11th 12th and 13th and I know the library staff and the, and the consultants would, um, would love to have big turnouts for those. So um, we, all that information is available, again, on Engage Longmont. So hopefully people will take advantage of that opportunity to weigh in on what you would like to see in your library in the future. Councilmember Peck. Thank you. I just want to remind the public that we are going to have the showing of the film No Small Matter Thursday at the museum um, from 6 to 9. You can come at 5.30 if you want to hang out <laughs> and network. Um, this supports our early childhood uh, work plan, early childhood preschool, and it also supports our the HB 201011, which we just voted on to support as our house bill. So we hope to see all of you there to uh, support our work plan, to support our uh, governor's uh, birth to three-year-old support, and hope to see you there. Councilmember Christensen. I've been trying to clean out my house a little bit, and um, I came across my sisters and I, my, the book that my sister and I used uh, when we were Girl Scouts. And I would like to read the Girl Scout Promise and the Girl Scout Laws because I think it is, um, along with the Boy Scouts and the Bluebirds and 4-H, uh, all these things that we seem to understand more clearly as children. And they are indeed easier to do as children, but they're still good principles for civic engagement and for community. To do the Girl Scout promises is on my honor. I will try to do my duty to God and my country, to help other people at all times, and to obey the Girl Scout laws. Here are the Girl Scout laws. 
A Girl Scout's honor is to be trusted. A Girl Scout is loyal. A Girl Scout's duty is to be useful and to help others. A Girl Scout is a friend to all and a sister to every other Girl Scout. A Girl Scout is courteous. A Girl Scout is a friend to animals. A Girl Scout obeys orders. A Girl Scout is cheerful. A Girl Scout is thrifty. A Girl Scout is clean in thought, word, and deed. Those are good things for us all to aspire to. Thank you. I hope everyone has a good week. That's cool. I didn't know that. Uh, Council Member Lago Faring, top that. Yeah, I can't. I can't. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, Should we just adjourn just, now? No. Okay, no. You know what? I had, I attended three board meetings since the last time we met. El Comité, the museum, and um, today the um, youth council. And so it was... I was thoroughly impressed. I was thoroughly impressed with the museum. Um, they're working on um, their master development plan. It's very extensive, very thorough, and they're um, hoping to get that going, uh, launching it in, or I'm sorry, the idea. So in the part of their master plan, the um, idea, the inclusivity, diversity, equity, and accessibility initiative, That's they're hoping to launch that in February. So I've been able to kind of offer some input and and work with them, so I hope to continue that um, that dialogue um, in how to to kind of meet the diverse needs of our community uh, th through the museum. Um, they recently had an opening for the Terry Maker Because the World is Round exhibit. Um, I think it starts tomorrow. Their um, opening was fr this past Friday. And they did qualify for um, the S SCFD, um, the Scientific and and cultural facilities district um, tier two qualifications. The tier one is, you know, it, it pretty much encompasses um, Denver Museum Art, the Botanical Gardens, so the huge entities. So for us to gain that tier two, that's very exciting as far as um, funding goes. So, so check them out, check out their exhibits, they're doing great work. Um, El Comité will be having their fundraiser on March 21st, I believe was the date that they gave, Saturday. We were playing around with looking at a Friday in April, so we might go that route as well. But they are collecting um, donations for baskets, council, so <laughs> anyone wants to contribute to a basket um, to assist with their funding. And the youth council, we got to hear them today, and they were talking about projects that they were um, that they are promoting this this year um, and looking at and so something that they had asked of me just really finding ways to connect with initiatives and task force that we're doing um, in the city so I'm thinking the climate action task force in regards to their environmental sustainability um, and looking at mental health and positivity what other su SAM supporting action for mental health so there's ways that we can work in a, um, a and put put them to work in our community and give them opportunities to come speak and and practice their um, leadership skills. So that, that's all I have to say. Have a great week. Councilor Martin. Thank you. I'd just like to say that uh, although I have nothing against the Girl Scouts in particular, that I think once um, uh, one attains a certain age, if you're not in the military, um, Obeying orders is something one should think twice about. Thanks. Not me. I always do what I'm told. Uh, that was a joke, by the way. All right. Um, anybody else? Okay. Harold, do you have anything? Actually, I do. Kay. So uh, I was correct on the road piece, just so everyone knows. Um, they are, that has to be submitted, and they're working in the design review. The piece I did want to address is David Bell. Is, that is the, an area of need that was in the plan, and David is working with some other property owners um, to, to figure out a way to, to do a park. It's actually gonna be really expensive, so they're trying to work through the issues. So he is engaged in that conversation for the broader neighborhood. So I just wanted to pass that around, and then I will get with you, Council Member Faring on the Parks and Rec and Trails Master Plan. Eugene. No comments, Mayor. All right, anybody opposed to a, an adjournment? Uh, it's been moved. I'll second it. All in favor, say aye. Aye. We're adjourned. <laughs>